Is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It is a glorious and wonderful thing to proclaim that our Savior is alive, that our God is not dead, that He continues to call to us, He continues to seek us and to find us, that He is our good and glorious shepherd. And we are the lost sheep that he leaves the 99 to come and find. We can be secure and firm in our faith. We can rejoice that our Lord is with us now and always. Let us bow our heads and go to our loving God in prayer. Almighty, powerful, heavenly Father, Son, and Spirit, our triune God, our holy and wonderful God, our God who has a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, a plan to give us a hope-filled future, a plan that involved Christ leaving the glories of heaven to come and suffer as we suffer here on earth, to walk as we walk, to be persecuted and die for our sin and to be raised up holy and righteous so that we may join and be heirs with Christ. We thank you, God, and we praise you for these amazing spiritual things. We rejoice, O holy God, that you continue to reveal your glories each day to us. We pray that we'll ever be watching for where you are working and desire to join you there. That we'll continue to read your word and be drawn closer into right relationship with you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray, O gracious and holy God, that we will honor you this day and always, that as we worship today, that we will know you and make you known. And that in all these things we will enjoy you, O oh holy God, now and forevermore. These are our hopes and our prayers, and we ask these things as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Family of God, I invite you to stand and join in our opening hymn, number 217 in the Red Hymn. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hymn 217 in the Red Hymn.
family of God, we rejoice that we have a risen and active Savior, that he continues to seek us and find us, to call to us. We are called to respond to what God proclaims. We are called to align our hearts and mind with God and confess that we are sinful, that we are broken, that though we may have had good intentions, we have fallen short. But in confessing our need for a Savior, in declaring that we have Christ as our Savior, we can be assured that we will be forgiven. But let us begin this process anew. Let us join together in our corporate prayer of confession. I am holy God of resurrection power. We need you now and always. We have been overcome by our sins, failures, and losses. We follow our Now hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. If a person is in Christ, they become a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Family of God, I invite you to open to 714 in the back of your red hymnal where we'll find Psalm 139. If you look there, you will notice it is sort of broken out into paragraphs. I'll be reading that first section. You all read the second one. I'll be reading the third, which goes over to the very top two lines of the next page. And there's three lines for you all, a grouping for me, and then a grouping for you all to close us on. This will be our Psalter, number 139. Let us read responsibly. <clears throat> o oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there For you created my inmost being. You quilted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Family of God, I do rejoice in celebrating Easter. I rejoice in this time we have together. It is a joy to be able to remember, to draw close to our God, to celebrate His resurrection, and to rejoice in the new life we have in our readings of Scripture today, both will be from Matthew. The first one is going to come to us a little bit out of the mindset we might have for Easter, but it's drawing into the larger idea God has revealed for our message today. So bear with me as we're going to be reading Matthew 26, beginning at verse 46 and going down through verse 56. This is picking up where we left off last week, where... Christ has been with his, excuse me, not last week, but a few weeks ago, where Christ was with his disciples in the garden. And they were praying, and they continued to be asleep. And he came to them a third time and said, Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him and was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck a slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by it. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he would at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how, when the, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen this way? 
At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, and the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. The word of the Lord. Let us hear now this reading from Matthew 27, beginning at verse 64 and going down through to the end of verse 27, into 28, and on to verse 6. May our hearts and minds still be open to hear what Scripture is saying to us, the church. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people, He has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it secure as you can. So they went and with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May all who have heard these words trust that they come from our gracious and loving God, that they are to strengthen us to empower us and enable us to be so much more this day and forevermore. This time I invite Diana up for our children's time. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. There are many things that remind us of Easter. Can you think of some? Spring flowers, beautiful flowers, remind us of Easter. <coughs> Easter baskets, Easter bunnies, eggs. Have you ever wondered about why we use the egg to be reminded of Easter? Well, do you, um, you know when a mother hen sits on her eggs and then after a few weeks, do you know what happens? <laughs> Little chicks hatch. Yes, right. And there's new life. Well, eggs remind us of new life, um, and it reminds us of Easter when Jesus came out of the tomb. The tomb was empty, and he was alive, new life, new life in us. Um, we celebrate Easter Sunday because that's the day he came out of the grave, and praise God, we have life with him because he came out of the grave. Have you ever found an egg on an Easter egg hunt and it was empty? And oh my gosh, you were probably really disappointed. There wasn't any chocolate or jelly beans or toys inside. But now, when you see an empty egg, you can be reminded of the grave being empty, the tomb being empty. Um, in Matthew 28, 5 through 6, it says that there was an angel there to tell them, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. The grave is empty. Jesus isn't in there. He's alive. And because he's alive, we are alive too in him. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that we celebrate life eternal with you because you went to the cross, you took on our sin, and you died. But then on the third day, you rose again, and hallelujah, we have life in you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a sweet, sweet joy for me to stand here and see so many faces out there. 
You may recall that I have said we have been in Lent since 2020 when we had that whole beginning of the pandemic and even new levels of uncertainty, anxiety, and frustration. And I can assure you this church has not seen this many people since 2020. It is glorious for you all are here. I am thankful that some of you have gone to multiple services already today and you chose to grace us even more. Uh, it is just a joy to be here and to see everybody. And to recognize this is fulfilling God's plan. Every time I say that, I have to pause because that puts new light on all sorts of the different things going on in my life and in your life. To say that it's fulfilling God's plan to think about all of the pollen sufferers who have newly joined me in the suffering of springtime allergies. They've talked about the joyous reality of our spring that we've had these hot days, cold days, hot days, cold days has created such a level of pollen that people used to not ever be bothered suddenly are crying and weeping and really confusing the CDC people because if you go in anywhere and it has this list of things you need to check off before you go in, like if you're going into Morning View um, Recovery and Rehabilitation, they're like, you do know it's allergy season, right? I don't know if I'm sneezing because I'm sick or because I've just come in from outside or, you know. Life is so confusing. Of course, I was reminded this morning as we were struggling to figure out how exactly we were doing having two anthems today. Is this what we planned? Is this what we had in mind? You know, we get things in our head that church and everything else should just be neat and orderly. Presbyterians love to proclaim that, that we're decent and in order. My reality of being a minister going on 20 years coming around this fall is like we're doing our best to be decent and in order, but usually we're just as sinful as everybody else. We have a high goal. But this is fulfilling God's plan. Most of us don't like the idea that God's plan does include us having to suffer. I would love for life to be simple and easy. I'm constantly trying to figure out what can I do to make my life easier. I have people who talk about, Roy, why are you taking this particular path? Well, I've driven enough other ways. No, this is the one with the least traffic, and I'm least likely to be frightened by someone driving badly and making me have higher anxiety levels and whatever else. I would love it if I didn't have anxiety. But the reality is the more pain you suffer, the more ways you know you can be hurt, and the more reality you have of how mortal you truly are. But this is all fulfilling God's plan. I just read those words that Christ said to all those gathered there in Matthew. I'm sure they didn't have a clue what it meant. I'm sure the disciples still didn't really understand it, even on Resurrection Sunday. This fulfilled God's plan. Christ came from heaven to die on a cross. He was born in that manger to die on a cross. If we went back further in that reading there in Matthew 26, it's like Christ was coming to die on a cross, and yet he was praying, Lord, if there is a way for this cup to come for me, well, that's part of our assurance that Christ was fully divine and fully human, because part of the human existence is the suffering, the anxiety, the worry, the hope. That we can avoid suffering and pain. Christ knew the Father's will needed to be done. He knew as he was with God the Father and planned out how it would happen before everything was spoken to being with creation. Before we have any words at all, before Genesis even considered that the Spirit of God was soaring over the formless void and spoke creation into being, God had this as the central part of the plan. That he would be betrayed by a kiss. That a disciple would betray him. The reality for us to recognize, oh, we're probably going to have to suffer betrayal ourselves because it's part of growing. Again, I hope you never get betrayed. So I'm seeing most of you out there, you probably already experienced that though. If I've done that myself accidentally, I apologize. It was never what I hoped to do, but... Sad reality of being broken. We're all sinful and need forgiveness. We need grace upon grace upon grace. You may be reading and thinking, do you suppose grace could have been poured out to Judas? We don't know what could have happened to Judas. He gave up and ended his life before there was any chance to meet Christ on Easter Sunday. 
It's the reality for us in fulfilling God's plan is to keep working with God and trust that he is going to do something with whatever we're suffering through now. Some of you are thinking, Roy, you don't know what suffering is. You're right. I've never lost a spouse. I've never lost a child. I've not lost my mom and dad, but I know eventually it will happen. I've lost some really good friends. I've been stabbed in the back by really close friends. I've been stabbed in the back repeatedly by family. Just the reality of how we all do. We may not mean to hurt each other, but it happens. <coughs> and it's all part of God's plan. I don't know that the I would have loved the plan not to have to involve that, really. But God can use that. God takes our suffering and pain just as he went and suffered on the cross. And he refines it. He restores it. He renews it and us so that we can be that blessing. I didn't have that part of them trying to seal the tomb to help us remember that we might think we have some control. The whole reality of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who were in power when Jesus was around trying to kill him, was to stop what he was doing. You and I might think that we can do something to stop God's plan, but what happened here should be an example that God is going to fulfill God's plan. God is going to use you as a blessing whether you're going kicking or screaming or whether you're playing along and enjoying the ride. Thus the reality of suffering. Thus I, I still haven't fully grasped what this message told me from a pastor sharing a previous event of this Presbyterian pastor who had the hard life and his house was at the bottom of the hill and the well that he needed for his home was at the top and he would walk up there every day and Sometimes when he was coming back with his water, he would trip and fall and roll all the way back down the hill. And he would pop up and say, Lord, I'm glad that's over. Let's go again. And he'd go back up to the top of the hill. <laughs> when I stop and fall and roll down to the bottom of the hill, I'm still not quite jumping up and going, thanks, God. I'm glad we got through that one. In my perspective of fulfilling God's plan, the bigger reality is not to rejoice in what we've endured, but to rejoice that our God is with us. To rejoice that we have a Savior who has suffered more than anyone could. For how many of us we suffer and we fall into temptation, he resisted all temptation. He was doing that in fulfilling God's plan. And we can fulfill God's plan even no matter how broken, weak, or downtrodden we feel because God is with us. He didn't put us here to figure it out on our own. He didn't bring us here to have to sit back and ponder, how did he knit the universe together? We just need to rejoice that he did. And he loved us enough to put us in it, to suffer with us, so that we can go out and bless others. We can be with him in shepherding the flock. We can work with God in helping to find the lost and the weary, those who are outcast along the highways and the hedges. That we can look up and see things like rainbows and remember what God does in forgiving and caring and rebuilding and restoring. Again, that rainbow came to us because God had done a terrible, destructive thing because that's what was needed in that time to fulfill his plan. But he wanted to assure folks by putting his bow, his item of destruction, in the clouds to remind us that he would not destroy the earth by flood again. God continues to make promises, to make covenants, to encourage us and empower us that he is with us. And no matter what may come, no how, how often we might lose our way, he is continually there leading us, guiding us, and directing us. We had to read Psalm 139 today because it's just such a powerful psalm to me. The third, first time I remember reading that psalm, I was on my first mission trip flying to Romania. And of course, the reality is first time me flying. I, I felt for the person who was in the plane seat next to me because as your first time seeing Blunt County from there, I was leaning over and trying to look out the window and I realized, oh, I'm crushing this poor guy. <laughs> of course, the reality of our flight is, you know, I would love to have a nice, long, comfortable rest. And I'm this huge guy in this tiny seat, numb from head to toe from being cramped in this plane. And I'm like, well, since I can't sleep, I'll read scripture. 
and opened up to Psalm 139 and get to that part where it says, you rise on the heavens, you land on the other side of the sea. Someone opened their thing and the sunlight shines right through on me and I'm just like chilled head to toe knowing that God is with me even in this crazy farm boy going to the other side of the sea to go minister in Romania. <coughs> Not far from where that big battle is happening now. But God is with us in all these things. The reality is, are we turning back to our God? Are we recognizing where he is working? Are we reading his word to give him an opportunity to show that that ancient text still has power for us today? And it is all working together to fulfill God's plan. I continue to remind us of the power of the cross. That is my job as a pastor, and it is especially a fun job on this day where we've taken a wooden cross and covered it with flowers. For just as the reality is the cross was a symbol of suffering and death that millions throughout the world now hold up as a symbol of hope and encouragement and peace, we've taken what was dead and made it alive with flowers to show how <laughs> God takes the dead and the weak and the weary and renews and restores. Fulfilling God's plan. We can't do it on our own. It's up to God to fulfill it. But if we're looking for what he is doing, if we're trusting, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, that he has a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, a plan to give us a hope-filled future, if we're looking for God to be doing what he is doing, how much more wonderful will it be when we see it? That we can taste and see that the Lord is good. That we can interact with fellow believers, with those who don't know God yet, and discover how God is working in and around and through and for. Let us trust that God is fulfilling his plan within each of us for each of us, for the blessing of the universe. Let us rejoice in our God. Let us give God thanks and praise. Let us trust that his will will be done today and forevermore. To God be the glory. Amen. I invite you to open up your red hymnal once again so you can find our affirmation of faith, the 100th Psalm, which is number 709 in the back of the red hymnal. I just love for us to use this psalm for it is so joyous and encouraging for us to remember that we can do as it says because we have a risen Savior. Let us join together in Psalm 100, number 709 in the red hymnal. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his steadfast love forever. His faithfulness continues 